Hi. Thank you guys all for coming out. Um, like Jed said, talking about emotion today. So before I begin, you don't have to be a female designer or woman in building to get anything out of this presentation. Anyone who designs for people, reports to a person, is a person, can benefit from better understanding emotion and how it relates to our consumer. So here's kind of a roadmap of where I'm gonna take you today. I'm gonna to start out by talking about how in the world of design and building, women are still a minority. We're, we're making waves, but we're still, we're still that odd man out. And then I'm gonna kind of jump into how using our emotions to understand those emotions on our customers, our consumers, can really help us put ourselves in their shoes. And then how that creates this emotional power. We have that story of how we solved our problem by relating to our customer and what we can use that for to really share our ideas. So when was the moment you realized that the world of design, the world of building, any STEM related field, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, was mostly men? For me, it was when I started my study of design at a school of engineering. My graduating class had 16 students and three of which were female. Now that's a small sample size, I understand that. But my roommates at the time were in the School of Engineering. And for them, it was more like being three in hundreds. So it's clear to see, that was only 10 years ago, that we're making waves, but still, we're just not very well represented in that world of STEM. So if I ask someone to describe a builder or a plumber or someone in that industry, they're probably thinking of someone more like this. And historically, they'd be right. But what's really neat to see is that while toys for young children used to be so focused on boys for technology, building, tinker toys, we never really focused on that female audience. And now we're seeing this shift. And products like this shown here, I mean, we're focusing on, on girls super young, trying to get them involved with software coding or solving problems through constructing things. And it's so exciting to see, we're, we're encouraging that engineering possibility, that critical thinking at such a young age. Now, this is the now. So when I was young, we still didn't have this focus on this early education. So as a professional today, I'm still one of those groups. We're still trying to pioneer. It's a trailblaze for these young girls to show them that there is real possibility in this world of science and math. And because we're still in the minority, we do sometimes get pegged with stereotypes like this. <laughs> so thank you, Karen. But what does it mean to be emotional? Does it mean we cry easily? I have my tissues up here, not, not because I'm gonna cry, but because I have a bit of a cold. But does it mean we cry easily, we're easily offended? Does it mean we base our decisions on feelings? I wanna really focus on that last one because a lot of people do. There is no shortage of studies out there. If you start researching psychology on gender and DNA versus emotional expression, that you will get lost. That's where I started my research for this presentation and it is, it is a downward spiral. There's so many articles out there. But one of the more interesting things that kept coming up was it's not simply a DNA issue. You know, we're not gonna have that debate. I only have 30 minutes, but it doesn't matter whether you're male or female that makes you more expressive or connected with your emotions, but it's a combination of genetics, historical roles in society, um, imbalances of power and status. And all these things together, that really determine how one expresses their emotions. Historically, the female has been painted as this, this maternal instinct, this mama bear. Now, there's tons of paintings that go you know, all the way back before, before the Bible of this mother and child bond. We're painted this picture of this nurturing, this caregiver. And traditionally, historically, the mom has been that. So we do tend to see females in this more sensitive light, this more touchy-feely emotional aspect. But like I said before, it's not just a DNA thing. So whether you're male or female, if anyone tries to offend your child, you know it brings out a side of you. That's very reminiscent to a mama bear. It puts up this defense mechanism and you have that emotional reaction. So you're emotional, you accept it, you own it. How does that affect you in business? We can turn this into a real competitive advantage. Knowing your emotions and being able to identify and anticipate others' emotions can really be the changing factor. It can be your kryptonite in designing for people. There's an old expression to walk a mile in someone's shoes. We've all heard it, but that by definition is what empathy is. You're changing your perspective. You're putting yourself in someone else's viewpoint. You're looking at the world from where they stand. 
we probably do this more than you realize. You often anticipate how people are going to respond before you speak or one hopes. You think about how others are gonna to react to what you're putting on for the day. Do you want to shock and awe? Maybe you wanna blend in and be more subdued. You're already doing this without even realizing it. So why do you do this all the time in product design? This especially relates to this purchase power. Very often we bring our emotions into the decision making of when it comes time to buy something. Whether you're choosing that artisanal jam at the supermarket or buying a home, emotion plays a factor. Why did I buy my current house? I fell in love with the property, okay, and the kitchen. But I fell in love with it. Love is a word we typically reserve for family members, close friends. But yes, I love my house, absolutely. Who doesn't want their product to fall into that category? Why is artisanal anything having a moment right now? It's because people love that idea of this human touch. The fact that someone took the time to handcraft and hand labor and select the best or the simplest ingredients and create something specially for them versus this mass produced product that just sits on a shelf somewhere. People love that humanistic approach. Why does this matter? We don't design for robots, guys. We design for people. Whether it's a building or a product, your person is your end user. And it's very rare you find someone completely devoid of emotion. For example, if you were to ask a non-architect or non-builder person, that sounds, a non-builder person, it's the official term, someone unfamiliar with blueprints to look at this and ask them which is more you know, intriguing to them, of course the blueprint doesn't mean much to them. They don't know how to interpret it. So by adding these touches of texture and furniture and color, they can see this, this room start to evolve and they can picture themselves there. This is the same reason we stage homes. We want people to envision and to have emotional connections with the space. It's the same reason real estate agents tell people not to hang family photos in the home. It's not because they don't look great. It's not because the picture of your kid inside the watermelon isn't awesome. It's because when people walk through the home, they want to be able to envision their family in the space and not someone else's. So how does this work in my world? Well, this is a story of two very extreme emotions. So as a designer, you can't always rely on user interviews to tell you where your product gaps are or where your needs are. You always have to dig a little deeper. So we do a lot of observational research at Delta. We go into people's homes with their permission and put cameras up in the kitchen and bath space. And we watch them. We watch them interact with our products day in and day out. And of course, initially, they dress a little nicer, they stand a little straighter, they're aware that the cameras are there. But as time goes on, they become more relaxed. They go back into their routines, and we start to pick up on little nuances of where the real opportunity lies. So this is how we found out about the drama that we like to call chicken hands. You guys know the moment. You've just touched raw chicken in your kitchen, and now anything in your immediate vicinity is at risk of being a biohazard of salmonella. You don't want to touch anything, including your faucet. So we were watching time and time again, and people were using their elbow to turn on the faucet or a dedicated wooden spoon to touch the faucet. And by adding our touch technology, we were able to solve these makeshift approaches. So now with the back of your hand or your nose or any part of your body, you can tap on, tap off the faucet without risking of poisoning your entire family because of the chicken hands. So that was an emotion of frustration. The second part of this story is that of aspiration or who our user wants to be. So for, for years, our users have been taking commercial sized products and putting them into their homes. Well, your home is not a commercial sized kitchen. So these products were large and obtrusive in the space. And we started asking why. People have a very emotional connection to food. Are there any emotional eaters out there? I know I am. <laughs> And when people talk about food and preparing food for their family, it can be a very emotional experience. But especially, again, right now, we're having this movement where people want to prepare food in their home more. This act of serving, this act of knowing what's going into your food, is really, it's really at, of mind right now. It's really important. And so people were wanting to improve their game. They're wanting that home chef ability, or at least to appear like they're a better home chef. So they were choosing products that resembled those they'd seen in restaurants or TV, but they weren't the right size. So what we did is we took the same functionality that we saw in these commercial grade faucets and brought it into a residential size product. We took the spring and we took the arm and the movability and flexibility of the functions 
and made it a simplified form, much sleeker and more appropriate in scale for the home. We have our magnetite docking, so it stays neat and crisp and out of the place, and it's not just hanging over your sink, so it keeps it very fresh looking. But again, it's the right scale, the right size, and just more usable for the home chef. So we combined frustration and these lofty goals of being this amazing home chef, and we understood our user better, and we came to a great solution. That is not a good story. I mean, emotional power. Like, I said chicken hands, and everyone's like, I know, I know what she's talking about. And when we can tell these stories, people relate to us more, and they can, they can connect better. It's much better than a spec sheet up there and me telling you what our faucets can do. So telling those stories can really be moving. In school, we're taught to design for personas. This is not a generic person. This is creating a very specific user with unique characteristics. So say we have Sarah here, mother of twins, enthusiastic painter, diabetic, or Dan, Single dad, movie buff, budget conscious. Designing for one of them creates a whole new picture than just 30-something adult consumer. And it creates much more rewarding and challenging experience trying to get specific. A great example of this is the OXO product. Is anyone familiar here with the OXO Good Grips collection on the right? It's an amazing collection. And this is an awesome story. So Sam Farber, the creator of OXO in partnership with Smart Design. But Sam Farber was on vacation in France with his wife and his wife suffered from arthritis. And she was really struggling peeling all these apples for an apple tart. And her peeler looked like the one on the left. So at the time, this was a very common kitchen utensil and they all had metal handles. There was no non-metal handle option. If you bought a more expensive peeler, you got a nicer grade quality of metal, but it was still metal. So after working with Smart Design, in 1990, they brought to market this Santaprene material that you see on the right, and it has the fins. So now there's these indentations on this oval shape that imply where to hold it, how to hold it, you want to touch it, and it was based off of the grips on a bicycle, like the, the fins that you'd see on an old bicycle handle. So he set out empathizing with his wife, who had arthritis, and focusing on her, but knew that he was going to create a product touched by many, and if he made it a specialized product, he'd never get the <coughs> volumes he needed to justify the cost. So he made a handle that was better for everyone by focusing on this very specific problems that his wife had. Here's another example. How does this make you feel? Anybody love car shopping? <laughs> Feeling warm and fuzzy? Oh yeah. So we're all familiar with this. It's a spec sheet you'd see in the window of a car, listing everything from gas mileage to safety features of the vehicle each specific to the make and model you'd find on any car lot across the country. But what does this really mean? I mean, okay, there's airbags and seatbelts and that's great, but technology is changing. We have more safety features than ever in these vehicles and being able to understand them and know what they do is a whole nother thing. So how about if I explain them like this? <laughs> Practice. It was really fun. Fun, okay. We did really turn. Good <laughs> What do you want for dinner tonight? Me tacos. I've got to run by the grocery store to pick some things up before.
So that's pretty emotional. I don't know if it's my maternal instinct or what, but you watch that and you're moved. And all of a sudden, it makes a lot more sense why someone would want those characteristics in their car. It's approaching, you know, who doesn't want to protect their family. It's all these emotional triggers. And I think that's the capability we have as designers is to tell our stories like that. We can use our emotions to connect with our consumers, to solve those problems, and then use that same story to explain what we're trying to do with our product. So it's not to say that manufacturing and all of our you know, generic parts and pieces and math and physics isn't still important. We still need all those in our tool belt, but it's important to take all of those and combine them and think about these people. Think about the people that are in our spaces where our products already exist and focus on what their needs are and what their emotions are and to solve for their everyday needs. You know, what experiences are they having in these spaces and how do they relate to each other? You know, they're already having these amazing feelings and emotions. Let's cater to them. Let's help them experience these more so. We can help them have relaxing environments in their home. You know, we can help them have moments of joy. You know, not all emotions are exciting, but like we said earlier, even moments of frustration can lead to really groundbreaking products. So it's not just the technology piece. It's not just the cold hard facts. It's not the facade of emotion. We can't just be, you know, those crummy fake salespeople that just, that's not selling I mean salespeople. I'm not trying to slam salespeople. We can't be <laughs> fake with our emotions. We can't just be emotional to be emotional. It's that genuine combination of using the innovation and connecting with our users' emotions to have that really genuine product and solution. My key takeaways are use your instincts. If you are emotional, male or female, own it. Use it, you know, you have this connection, you have this amazing ability to understand feelings, use that. Dive deep and get personal. Oftentimes it's in chasing after those outliers that you find yourself going down a path you hadn't anticipated, and it's kind of like the OXO story. You could create something that's better for everyone by focusing on those really unique individuals and tell that story. Everybody loves a good story. It's much easier to relate to something that you've experienced or you can experience or you know someone who had that moment. Use that to your advantage to really get your point across. Thank you.